but thanks for Eric for letting me uh, give this talk out here. You know, with all the telemedicine we're doing right now, it's certainly good to sort of talk about something besides just refilling eye drops and dry eyes and left eyes for a change. So thanks for giving me kind of a break out here. Um, uh, I want to talk more about um, Micropulse, um, the TLT, the bladeless MIGS option. Um, kind of my interest evolved from here. Um, a lot of it actually came from, I was always interested in, in technology. I've been doing uh, CPC for years now. Um, the Micropulse, when it first came out several years back, um, one thing's option that happened to me was um, throughout um, COVID, actually, when actually the infection pandemic began, uh, one option I had to realize that I needed Typically what I would do for someone who's in the 40s or high 20s, I would do a max drop. So I'd probably do some sort of incisional surgery. Then things would happen where like, they would not be able to come back for post-op day one. They didn't have a ride, they didn't feel comfortable, they were too scared, office was closed, we had certain office hours, they couldn't accommodate, they didn't have a mask. So I realized that I needed some option that I could do for the patients, which involved very little chance, I mean, no chance of endophthalmitis, no chance of a blood leak, no chance of a hypotony with a shallow AC, no chance of severe vision threatening complications because patients can't come back for follow-up. There's no option here. Those complications are extremely rare, but they do happen. They're easy to fix, but they involve going back to the OR. So I need something more dependable, predictable and safer and low risk during that time. And so even though I've been using um, uh, Micropulse TLT for a long time now, it's played a particularly strong role lately now where patients are just averse to getting things done. We kind of get started here. Um, these are a list of my financial disclosures. Uh, the outline of our talk, and I'll, I'll go through it uh, quickly so because I know it's everyone's evening time. Uh, where Micropulse actually stands, um, it's in the treatment algorithm. Technically, how the Micropulse energy systems have, in general, for a FACO energy, for instance, have reduced rates. Um, how Micropulse TLT became the MIGs of the CPC and how they really are different technologies. Um, evolutions in safety from the G probe to the P3 probe to the most recent revision two of the P3 probe uh, that was made back in November. How I explain uh, Micropulse TLT to patients, a video of me actually doing the surgery. I, I did this procedure twice just the day before yesterday. I have videos from there, so you'll see those. And at least my experience and outcomes. Standalone on eyes that are 2025, 20, uh, combined with FACO, combined with MIGs and combined with more complicated from the fingers. We'll get started here. So where it fits in the algorithm, and this is where you're stuck trying to get a 30% reduction in IOP. You know, and one of the biggest things we see every day is this, is enough of the drop drama. Uh, when the patients ask you, can I get a sample? You just, I get the temptation, we're busy, you're slammed in your office, you have many patients waiting, you're behind. Here you go, here's a sample. But actually, when we can pause and stop for a little bit, and you know, and the funny thing about COVID is that you can't give samples on telemedicine visits. You have to listen to the patient more. So when they say that, or they mention some of that, you ask and realize some of these drops are costing $100 a month for three months for a patient or $200. It's extremely expensive for patients, especially those who are retired. They may not have a pension, they are on social security. This is hard to do, it's hard for them to explain it. So no one's gonna say, doctor, that drop is too expensive. Some will. But some of them will just say, can I get a sample? So you ask them that, ask them how much they actually are paying out of pocket. And then you realize, oh my gosh, these poor patients are being suffering from this thing. You know, a sample that you give them is only gonna last them two weeks, three weeks max, because they're putting five drops in each eye, they're gonna run out so fast. It's not gonna last them three months for their next visit. We need a longer term solution here. So drops are just not allowed. Regarding like what pressure we need to give them, if you aren't sure of a target IOP, and that's a whole different talk. Uh, it's, it's typically 15. Um, exceptions are unusually tried in uh, high untreated T-maxes, over 30, knee vascular glaucoma, pigmentary, steroids, pseudoexfoliation, herpetic, true. Those people can maybe withstand temporarily now pressure in the high teens because the pressure was 40 before all this. Um, are the unusually lucky patients who somehow have no progression in the high teens or people who need a much lower pressure than 15, people who have normal tension glaucoma? We're talking nine to 13 of those patients. So when I teach residents and other interns who shadow me, I kind of tell them 15 is the new 20 if you have a valconus visual field defect. I mean, we know from the OAT study that, oh, low 20s are possible and in some patients with thick pachymetries. But if you have a visual field defect, any clinical trial, if you look at all the evidence, from the EMGT study, the AGIS study, CNGTS, any study you look at, it's really hard to prove that a pressure under 15 was the way to go. 
and um, was above 15 was defendable. When I'm seeing residents and they ask for a target, if anyone has a target above 15, I say, why? You have a good reason, I'm all for it, but typically you're looking at a 15. If you don't know what to do, that's the answer. How do we get there is a problem. So people, the temptation is to do adding a third or fourth glaucoma medication. And it really only produces a 20% IOP decrease in only 20% of patients. So it really is a waste of time. And four to five patients, the third glaucoma medication doesn't do much. So this is a citation here for the study done 20 years ago. This is not new knowledge. This is something we've known for 20 years, 16 years at least. Adding these drops helps your peace of mind, but not the patient's glaucoma. So you can say have a patient on Lumigan, Comigan, oh, I'll throw an eight or something. If you actually look at it, and the pressure fluctuates like the stock market. Oh, that's a bad analogy right now. But it goes up and down. So you can't say today, oh, you have a 10, good job. And next time you're 16, oh, what's going on? If they're on the same drop regimen, you look at their numbers over time. And I all showed the, the graph, the line plot to my patients. It's really not doing much. I look at like these three or four data points before I make my mind up. But really adding a third or fourth glaucoma drop really is not always the right smartest answer. Don't always feel compelled that you must have a patient on four to five medications before they warrant surgery. No, you need effective therapies before they need surgery. So maximum tolerated effective medical therapy is enough. Pouring down drops in someone's eyes just because you have samples, you have drops out there, just destroys the ocular surface and causes more dry eyes and blurred vision, not really helping the patient much out there. So it's my, I enjoy stopping drops more than I enjoy starting drops. Um, so keep that in mind that there's really no evidence based literature showing that adding the third or fourth drop helps 80% of patients out there. So don't just kind of go in the drops only. You may say the next option is trying SLT. Well, there's very minimal effectiveness after a second or third SLT. Um, only a third of the patients get a 20% reduction. Patients ask you, well, it didn't last that long, so why are we doing the same laser again? It's a very valid question. And evidence shows, here's a study from Al Corey here in New Jersey, that even two years later, after doing SLT the first, second, and third time, you can see it here, only a third of the patients actually get any res meaningful response, 20% or less. Most patients don't. So two out of three is doing nothing. It's just wasting time. And so much time can be wasted in glaucoma. Every three months and three months and three months, it's like down the drain of the toilet. You know, their, their nerve is suffering and suffering and suffering the longer we actually wait on these things. So I'm not a big fan of just delaying care versus delaying meaningful care. How about some stents? Well, yeah, so we have the ice inject. We have exciting news now about the hydra stent, which is having great results. Um, even though it's fantastic, there is issues because it's only for during at the time now for cataract surgery. In the future, they'll have it standalone, I believe. But if your patient is pseudophagic or does not have a visually significant cataract, we can't really do the hydrus or the, the eye stent right now. So that option's off the table for now. The patient does not want surgery. This is a, an obvious clear path. We can't do that. They don't want it at all. I don't, I don't blame them. I know I do think it's safe and the right thing. Patients should, just don't want it, especially now with COVID and risk of infections. They're really more leery of anything invasive than before. Oh, how about CPC? Oh, that thing. Oh, this patient has good vision. It's not blind. We're not going to touch that. That's the typical answer we get for CPC. So then you're stuck. No matter what you want to do in your life, everything is going to say, what am I going to do? I have nothing left. You're just circling around one of these things, really going nowhere, trying different options out there. Nothing really is proven to actually help your patient out there. And it can get very frustrating. So one thing that I've always felt before is like, don't just kick the can down the road. So let's say the can is a pressure under 15. We need to get that done. All right, so then here's a diagram. I made this back when I was teaching residents and I would teach the first years this thing says, no matter how jaded you get, even the guy who wants to go into retina, people are going to plastics, fine, stick this wheel. I guarantee spin the wheel and the typical clinic will run something like this. We're just gonna kick the can and do some BS with drops, an unnecessary additional SLT, treat the dry eyes, order some three months. And like, sometimes you have to stop spinning this wheel and say, no, let's actually pick up the can and get the job done. So avoid the temptation as we get back and we get busier now, just reassess. I'm saying I can do anyone else can just spin the wheel. I guarantee you they'll just do this. They see 60 patients a day because they're just spinning the wheel. Do something. If, they, if you're pressure under 15, hey, do whatever you want to do for this stuff. But if you're pressure above 15, this all waste time on that patient's optic nerve. It's getting squished and squished and squished. We need to lower the pressure. 
So of all the options we'll kind of focus on here today, I want to focus on this whole issue of the CPC thing. And the big question is, but this eye is good vision. Why would I ever do a procedure like that to this poor eyeball? Let's revisit that for this talk here. The way we'll look at glaucoma now addressing a surgical option here is the MIG spectrum, risk versus benefit. So on the very low end of the spectrum, we have an eye stent. So here we have like one to two millimeters of mercury reduction, low risk. On the very higher end, AMID valves are not MIGs, so legit surgery is much higher with a moderate risk. I still think it's a very safe procedure. Now let's see where MIGs have come along the way. And here they are. So you can see a KDB goniotomy, even more, uh, with even more effect with the very still low risk is the higher stent. Um, then moving on down to the, the path is the Omni, which is a canal plastic with a goniotomy, and then Zen, Omid valve. And the clear path is a bit higher risk, but you're getting a higher reward because it's a non valved This is my opinion of where things stand on the uh, radar. I like the glaucoma is fun because you can act like a quarterback. And here you have your wide receivers are the Omids. And your, um, Dave, when you go, you want to go 20 yards, 20 point eye production, go there. You get a couple points, you can do an eye drop. Your running backs are your drops. They can give you a couple points here and there. Your tight ends are your omnis and your zens. So be a football player. We don't have football now, so the best or anything. So this is the best thing you can do. Decide how you want to throw the ball. Some of you just want to, don't have to score tons of points. You just have to win the game. Meaning the patient should not go blind or suffer visual loss from glaucoma in his or her lifetime. That, that's the game we're actually playing. In this field, it's not exactly linear. There are some people who are outliers. For instance, the Cypass. So Cypass only gave as much reduction as pretty much uh, the eye stint, but it had, as we know, if it's not placed properly with the two anterior, it can cause some issues of corneal decompensation or endothelial cell loss after five years. So it was pulled from the market. On the other end, CPC. Now, CPC has changed a lot. We'll discuss how the techniques have changed and where this sits on the map. We all know it's actually pretty powerful and uh, moderate to low risk, in my opinion, with the new setting, which I'll teach you out here. Um, before, back in the day, it was moderate to high risk. True, that was settings 20 years ago. Technology has completely changed since then. The biggest change I'll discuss now is the Micropulse TLT. And that has become actually the safest option I can recommend for a patient um, because there's no incisions, there's no risk of endophthalmitis, there's no blebs, there's no infection risk, frankly, um, with actually significant IOP reduction. So that's where this fits, sits in your spectrum. Again, we're avoiding spinning around just three months, three months follow up and actually doing something for the patient. Try looking where this actually fits into your algorithm. Using a football analogy, um, this is essentially punting the ball. It's one of the safest plays you can do. You can't fumble, you can't have an interception, you can score a couple of points. And sometimes that's what it takes to win actually the game. It's all just winning by three points is what it takes. So this is a great option for people. So I'll explain now how Micropulse Energy Systems actually reduced complication rates and um, just how it became the MIGs of a CPC. So we're lucky that actually, um, actually Martin Uram, who's actually here in the state, uh, in Monmouth Retina, he actually was the first, uh, he's a retina surgeon, but he did the first clinical use of diode to CPC back in 1992. CPCs have been around since more, I mean, variations of it since the 1930s. And so the stigma we have about blind painful eye and can cause tysis and can cause hypotony, that's using even a different laser, a ruby laser, a YAG laser. Technology's changed completely since then. The diode laser is the safest laser. This is not just being a, a nerd, or I, I am self a, a nerd, that question, but the diode lasers are the same lasers that are used to, in the checkout counter supermarket. That red light that scans the barcode, that's a diode laser. There's no eye shields for that. Um, this is actually very, very safe technology. It's not the same technology that other CPCs had back in the day. Um, traditional technique, for those of you like us who did before, last five years, 2,000 milliwatts, titrate 250 milliwatts, up to 2,500, and then once you hear a pop, you back down by 250. You do approximately 16 to 20 spots over four quadrants. And yes, back then, there was risk of hyper iritis, hypotony, and cataract. I didn't have too many of those. Um, that historically was the issue. Then, you know, several years back, uh, Dr. Gaslan created or uh, popularized a slow burn technique where we actually realized, you know what, if you just delay the duration more, the 4,000 milliwatts, you can cut the power close to a little bit less than half and have a much safer profile, which I'll show you out there. Still, in spite of all these things, 20 years ago, the AAO says what you know already. It's only for refractory glaucoma, like this picture right here. Failed, Trav is minimally useful vision, 
any pain relief, their prior complicated surgery. It's kind of a latch ditch effort um, for, for people. Um, since then, MIGs have changed the landscape. And like when we're thinking about what to do for a patient, it's not just about a target IOP. Target IOP also affects them like, what can you do to achieve that target? So you can't just say a target is eight. It involves a trap or a bear belt, for instance, unless you actually can do that procedure. So whatever target you give, you have to achieve. Otherwise, you're just wasting time saying it's not there. If someone's a very high risk of complications, then the target really shouldn't be eight because the whole point of target is to save their vision. If they go blind from a tube exposure and optomitis or blood leak, then that's you're doing them a disservice. Target can actually go higher. When you have MIGs, it lets us have lower, lower target IPs confidently saying under 15, 13, we can do that by these procedures. So even though technology of CPC has changed a lot in the last 20 years, um, this study shows, for those of you who already do ECP, CPC is actually still more effective and actually safer. And it's actually not, I want to avoid the word stigmas. There are too many stigmas and thoughts and myths, stuff that we learned about 20 years ago, 30 years ago. If you look at current data, this study was published this year, and actually see what is actually happening, you realize your perspectives and attitudes and biases should change. So in this study, you see here that the um, FACO with transcleral CPC pressure are pretty much under, for years, three years later, under 15. With ECP, it's higher than 15, in the high teens still. And this is a continuous wave. This is old school, 1990s uh, CPCs, not the current techniques, which we'll, we'll talk about. Even in complications, there's more CME with ECP than with transcleral. And issues of needing more glaucoma surgery and losing lines of vision, more of that actually happens, you know, even light perception, losing vision, going blind, happens actually here with um, ECP than with TCP. So it's actually different. Um, it's actually was not even the safer technology before that. Talking about how continuous wave has changed from micropulse is a big deal. So the best analogy I want to give is using FACO machines. So back in the 1970s, those of you remember, um, earlier FACO machines produced extensive corneal decompensation and other complications. Extra, at one point, extra cap and intra cap were actually safer than FACO, especially for a very dense cataract. It really was the case. With sicker patient over 80 year old, 85 year old, their corneas couldn't handle it. They were, they were going to get corneal decompensation and, 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 and a PKP back then. There wasn't even DSEC. That was a problem. So even back then, 30 years ago, they realized among the many improvements that FACO machines had, starting off with the legacy units and going to infinity, was developing these pulse and burst modes. And even though it's pulse and burst, it's the same concept. You have energy for a small amount of time and you stop, let the eye and the tissues cool down. And this, along with viscoelastics, many other things, have actually reduced energy settings a lot since then, and reducing the rates of pseudophagic bolus keratopathy. And how many of you have seen right now see a patient who, from a routine phaco, needs a DSEC? It's really, really, really rare. No matter what, how dense the cataract is, it's really hard to do that. The few times I've ever seen refer patients who needed thousands of eyes of cataracts so far, including many white cataracts and brown cataracts, um, really someone who actually had pre-existing fuchs, maybe, that's only after an eye will exchange due to a, something else going on for the eyes. But it's never really rarely just a FACO caused this before. Um, it's rare. So we know, and we've now the standard of care is pulse and burst mode. In fact, you can't get a FACO machine without it. Um, they've actually upped the ante on this, on the, on the um, Centurion and the AMO Signature White Star. So pulse and phaco more, we know, has led to safety of the cornea. We know this. That same concept now is being used towards the CPC. So CPC basically says, instead of using a constant heat wave of energy that can destroy tissue and coagulate necrosis tissue, you're right. Do what we did in the 19, late 1970s, make it a pulse. So micropulse involves is 100 microseconds on, and then a nice cooling period off. So you're having a duty cycle of only about uh, 33% from on to off. Portion. And that cooling period, like the fake machine, lets the eye cool down, it prevents the burning that can actually happen with the thermal energy. So it's the same concept that we know has worked for cataract surgery. It's not working for this technology. Here's how it looks like in histology specimens. So on the far left, this is a untreated eye. There's your sclera, there's your serial body. As we go towards the right, you'll see purple areas. Now, this is coagulative necrosis and chronic inflammation. So the purple waves you see here with continuous wave, yeah, there's damage to the sclera, there's damage. This is 
artifact of tissue. There's no space here. That's not a, the angle. You see a lot of necrosis here. True. Now, when the gastrin put in the slow burn technique, it's much less. You compare this picture to the untreated eye picture. Again, a little bit of necrosis. It's still a continuous wave, CPC, constant heat. Now come to micropulse. Here, if I didn't show you two pictures directly, you may see a couple of lines here. Some areas of ciliary epithelium, non-pigmented being like necrosed, but the majority of tissue is safe. There's no destruction of the vasculature of the ciliary body, where you get hypotony and where you get like tysis from, is that all the huge plexus of vessels in the ciliary body will get necrosed. So yeah, you'll get a tysic line. There's nothing like that happening. You can't even get that if you try it. I mean, using standard settings, it's really hard to do that. It's like saying, okay, I'll give you a 50 year old with a trace NS cataract and a four plus PSC. You really have to try to get corneal edema from that. Most surgeons, it's physically impossible. Even a first year resident can't destroy the cornea that badly for that soft of a nucleus, no matter how much energy they put in. It'd be shocking if the cornea can handle it. It's shocking the one, how you can cause damage to the tissues and cause hypotony and these things. They just don't exist. It's from what I've seen literature because of how low the energy is. So it is totally different from this energy to before. You look at histology from the SLT. In SLT, you don't see holes in trabecular meshwork like you do in, when you see with ALT. ALT will create holes in the meshwork, actual holes in there. That's how it works. Not SLT, it's microscopic. So it's that big of a paradigm shift in technology. Um, I'll explain now how it's becoming the MIGs of the CPC era. So the biggest thing about CPC is that um, complication rates. Classically, those people who actually had complications were the ones who were kind of unfortunately doomed for failure to begin with. These were last ditch people, people who actually who probably should have gotten Traver tube, but they didn't want to do it because they were going to fail anyway. So this caused a sampling bias. Most patients who had, and all the studies you read about, were based on people who had failed TRABs or tubes, I mean, multiple failed TRABs, NVG, UVD guys, traumatic eyes, congenital eyes, anything you would have done would have not worked. Even an eye drop study on those patients would have failed. So it's not so much technology fail that you're setting yourself up for failure. And so here, when you look and see who actually got hypotony from the classical transcleral diode laser, the biggest risk factor was people who had NVG. That's what the biggest factor was. So we're not treating NVGs in our typical clinic. Other issues here are people actually having over 90 uh, joules of energy. That can cause a 70% increase in risk. Or uh, early operations or repeat cycle. Most patients are not like this. In fact, when we do micropulse TLT settings, it's a little math here. The settings we do, even the highest setting is 83 joules. It's nowhere near the 90 joules that caused problems before. So again, this is not the same issue before. You're not treating sick, last-ditch effort eyes. You're actually treating eyes with visual potential. And when you look at that and you start studying results of those, now it's changing a lot. Now it's not the same thing. So the best study I want to show here is outcomes of micropulse on eyes with good central vision. And so this study was published just last year. So again, a lot of the studies, the stigmas we have are based on 30-year-old information when we were training a generation ago. Things have changed since then based on data. This study from New York Eye and Ear Infirmary uh, looked at people with good vision. And how much is it so? Sorry, there's a question? Sure. If any questions, please, you can ask Brian, you can speak up. Uh, I'll pause after I dispense one slide here. Um, here we have patients who have logmar, we don't know what that is, 0.16, I give a small chart here, at least 20, 30 visual acuity. And all these patients had CPC with micropulse uh, TLT. And a year later, the vision stayed about the same. They all stayed at least ones without any glaucoma surgery, traps or twos they got still 20, 30 plus visual acuity. The ones who had a prior tube or trab, they still were better than about 20, 40, this one line lost. And you see the big difference is that they actually saved their pressure from 25 down to the high teens without surgery, 26 down to under 15 if they had prior surgery. Number of drops were also about the same as well. So you see there's a huge actual, even with eyes with good vision can do profoundly well with this technology. Among the patients who did lose vision, let's actually, I want to push the envelope on safety here. We have 70, 61 patients, 10 lines lost more than vision, a visual, a visual acuity. Okay, well, that's, that's still important. Let's see who those guys are. Five had due to cataract progression. So, okay, well, that's fixable. We do a cataract, it's gone in six minutes. 
One, due to CME, well, that CME in that patient was present preoperatively. So as we know, that's treatable. Two, due to iritis at the time of that six month or 12 month point, it later resolved. Two were unexplained, but they all had 10 2 islands on the visual field. These were people in 0.99 cups, and they could just be due to severe glaucoma, the natural course of it at 12 months after they having surgery. It's unclear which of these patients actually had prior glaucoma surgery, which didn't. Um, but the rate of vision loss, 20% losing a line, is the same as the tube versus TRAB study. So when you refer a patient out for like a TRAB or a tube, it's the same rate of vision loss as, as, the C, as this uh, Micropulse um, TLT. It's not like it's more vision losing effect. It's no different from getting a tube in the eye as far as what the studies actually are showing. Again, no one's getting hypotony from this. Again, this patient could have been someone who actually had NVG before. That was just one out of 60, though. Um, but otherwise, no hyphema, synthetic ophthalmia, no, no one's getting tysis, nothing like that's actually happened. Before I kind of go forward, any questions so far about what the process has been like regarding what uh, Micropulse has done? You can always unmute yourself or Brian's looking at, you can send a chat icon to Brian and he's looking for all the questions out there. How long have you been doing it, Raj? So Micropulse came out back around 2016 or 2017, 2018, around that time. I can't give, it's, 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 it's been available at, at, our, at our surgery center since then, even before in Brooklyn, where I was uh, before. Um, the G-probe, I mean, the classical transcurrent was since 2010. I mean, that's so at least 10 years of that. But Micropulse only, right, Brian, it only, and Kevin, that only came out like around 2016, right? Okay, thanks. So, if Brian and Kevin want to speak up on this one, I don't know when it was available, but I know we started using it very quickly. Micropulse, um, Micropulse became commercially available here in the United States in 2015. Um, so um, it was launched at, at that point, and then it's progressed in the last five years. So we're coming up on our five-year anniversary. And so, yeah, and the laser, Dr. Shmeen, which we have um, is, is this Micropulse laser the, um, in Somerset in our house, in, in, our, in our surgical center. Thanks. Since then, the, uh, a big change in safety happened in uh, November when this new probe was actually developed. So let me talk to some of the surgeons here who've been using the Micropulse since 2015 or 16. And now they said, well, I was having some complications. Now, I think I know why, actually. It has to do with the, kind of the way the probe was kind of, the way we handled the, our, the probes before. So this was the original probe from us five years, has kind of a, a notch on one end goes to the cornea and a flatter end goes to limbus. You put the curved end towards the limbus and the flat end back there. Um, has there a, the tip is actually pointing out, protruding out of the tip. So it actually does kind of touch the tissues along the way. And um, here you have, to, you have to keep it perfectly perpendicular to the limbus to target the tissue well. And you can tell it's hard to actually do that. And before, including me, I was guilty. We didn't always use a liquid coupling agent when we did this. Ah, that's fine. I, I know what I'm doing. It's like doing a YAG uh, capsulotomy. You don't always have to use a, a, a prism or a, to actually, uh, not a prism, a, um, a lens to do a YAG. You can do it without it. You can optionally do it to make a little bit better aim for you, but it's optional. So I, I treated myself this. And all, even when I did G probes with the continuous wave, I didn't really use a liquid cu coupling agent at all. I'm like, all right, I, I know what I'm doing. I don't have any problems with that. That overconfidence we get of something that we feel we've known for many, many years. And so then when we have that, also when we're actually doing it on the eye, it's hard to know exactly where the center of the eye is sometimes. The patient has a block. So when you're prying the eyelids open and where is the pointing perpendicular gets lost along the way. You throw in some visco, let's say you use some visco gel, and then now you're looking through a pool of viscous jelly. Again, it's hard to get the probe oriented properly. So many times a probe should have been like in this picture, it actually ended up looking like this. And look in the probe here. Here, if it's perfect, we really do aim directly into the ciliary body. But watch what happens when you do this. A little tilt from what before. And again, when the patient's eye is moving around, or not moving, because you're moving the eye itself, because it's blocked, it's really hard for you to tell often which way we're doing it. But if you do just a slight 15 degree difference, now you're getting iritis. And you really didn't know that. Even if you uh, <laughs> illuminate, if you move just one millimeter anteriorly, and not you're doing it, the speculum is doing it because the foot plate is so large, you need a speculum. So speculum kind of limits your exposure area. So now you're getting closer. Now you get the corneal edema. 
So a lot of times it just was hard to aim a, con, a convex surface to another convex surface. It's hard to get perpendicular uh, to that. It's hard to really get those things aligned properly. And that's why I think a lot of us were having complications back then. So these issues were easily to be changed with this very simple engineering fix. And so what they did now, the revised probe um, back in November actually had a very clear one side toward limbus and a fluid channel that actually traps the viscous uh, uh, fluid inside. So then you don't have any sort of a perfect aim going through. The overall uh, profile is smaller. So you actually don't even need, and I'll show you a video of me doing this from two days ago. Um, you need a speculum uh, more than half the time to actually do it in the eyes. A um, couple of details here about it. Like it's actually, um, it, you don't have to worry about how far posterior you're actually going. You kind of hug the limbus or just go 0.5 millimeters uh, or to one millimeter, just posterior to the limbus. Um, it really prevents you from having any angle. You keep it perpendicular to the eyes, parallel to the visual axis. So there's no wondering, am I perpendicular or am I not? If you do intravitreal injections, you have to worry about am I aiming towards the probe? Which way am I aiming? No, it's really hard to screw this one up. Um, that's why I really like it a lot. It keeps consistent here. Um, so yeah, there's advantages to here. Uh, we already discussed all this thing. It matches the plate much, much better. You can sort of tell here, we're not, I'm not sure that this eye is even being perpendicular to the globe or not. It's really hard to tell. Looks like it's a bit, I can't tell. Here I know exactly what's happening. This is in line exactly, it's contoured to the globe. So when that contour fits, perfect. And that's exactly how we wanted to do it. Um, so it's, again, it's really hard to screw this one uh, up. Um, you can do it without a speculum, as you can tell. And you can do it, um, the eyelid, the, the stem becomes speculum itself. Um, you'll see many times I treat just half the eye. I treat the bottom half of the eye only. So I don't even have to use a speculum or anything for the upper half of the eye. So that works really, really well. The patient, um, I'm very happy with that. So let me show how I explain the micropulse to the patients here. Um, so one thing I basically kind of, Patients are kind of are getting frustrated and say, we tried various drops, either they have many side effects, they don't work, or they're way too expensive. And I tell them, so like, we're kind of running out of choices now. We don't have to jump to blade surgery. You know, there's actually a newer technology option that gives us another choice that has no blades, no stitches, no implants. Well, oh, really? That seems useful. Now, of course, you'll have the patient who actually, when you see the word laser, they'll take a step back. And they said, well, well I've already had the laser this laser before, but I still wear glasses, my eyes still water. And I still have that itch, that itch, that sharp pain I get once in a while, every second. I still get that, even though you did a laser. I'm like, your pressure is 11, you know, what are you complaining about? But uh, this is different. So yeah, you kind of go through that aspect and say, this laser is completely different. It's not done here in the office. You could do in the office if you have one. Uh, it's stronger, but requires your eye to be patched for a few hours afterwards. So we didn't do this the first time. So they have to realize it's a pa eye patch for a while, not the same. We make sure your eye is totally numb so you don't feel the treatment. As long as they know it's not the same thing and you're gonna have issues with your uh, NBG patients who had PRP and PRP may have heard it back then and they said, I don't want laser again. This is a different laser completely. Um, so they have to kind of trust you on that, um, on how it is. Hey, Dr. Desai, we did have a question come in. Um, and what they're asking about is uh, weak zonules uh, during cataract surgery. So um, in eyes who have had MP3 in the past. Um, meaning for a retreatment or for, so they had MP3 in the past and could have led to weak zonules going forward? That's what I, I'm seeing here in the question. Um, give me a second, yes. Yeah, I mean, so, I really, I mean, so it's possible when we did, technique was that if you go back to my, the picture here, it's not been described in any of the many, many, many clinical trials out there that, that actually that occurred of having lens displacement or any kind of um, weak zonules. But the way it was possible to do that was actually when the original probe was developed without a, a liquid interface, the laser energy spreads out like a, like a head in, in the fog lights. The laser energy is being spread all over, like a huge triangle of area from like the limbus all the way down to here, including the zonules. We had no focus beam of, of laser. And that led to complications or weird complications like that one. Now when we use a liquid interface, it actually really, and you'll see me, what I'm talking about, you'll know exactly where the laser is actually hitting. And you're hitting this tissue here. You're not touching zonules. You can't contract the zonules 
at all. We'll go back to the histology slides here. I mean, you're not really doing anything to cause that. So that's not been described in any literature study that I've seen. I've went through almost everything out there. That could just have been someone who actually had pseudo exfoliation to begin with. We don't know. A lot of it's, un we don't know too much about it. You know, usually when you take a cataract out, afterwards when I see them postoperatively for pressure is 48, I can't really tell if they had pseudoexploitation. Some of that white fibrinous pseudoexploitation material is just not on the iris as much as it was when they were faking. So all I could do is this person probably had pseudoexploitation. I see a little um, pseudofacodinesis. It's hard to tell, but there's no description. I don't know if Kevin or uh, Brian wants to jump in on this. None of the literature studies I've seen have mentioned any zonular weakness. Have you all heard about this before? Yeah, no, we, we, we don't at the moment have any reported adverse events on weakened zonules, lens tilt, uh, when we're doing in combination with cataract surgery. So this is something that we do not really see. Mm -hmm. um, let me kind of show you the, what I did uh, on Monday. Um, you can sort of see the technique. So the, the first step here is actually to just use a, a block. So there's many options how to do it. Um, we're lucky at our, at our, at our surgery center, um, the anesthesiologists are amazing. They do the blocks for us. And they actually don't do retrobulbar blocks. They do actually a peribulbar block, which works phenomenally. So don't be scared of always needing retrobulbar. You can if you want to. If you're comfortable doing it, fine. That's okay. Um, I myself, when I do a block, I'm not aiming to go getting the second pop of tissue to tenons. I just kind of put the needle up to its base, and wherever it lands, good. I don't, I'm not poking around fishing too deep to get to here. So here you see our, our anesthesiologist. Um, he's actually using just a five eighth, five eighth uh, inch, um, I think 25 gauge needle, not a one and a quarter inch uh, retrobulbar Atkinson's needle. And you'll see how well it actually works. The trick is actually going more laterally than kind of inferiorly. And that he's, he said he's actually avoids a lot of blood vessels and better penetration. He's not poking around the globe. He's just going straight through parallel to the visual axis. And that does the job, especially if you use the, um, uh, uh, how are these? So watch carefully how this, um, our anesthesiologist does it um, and how short the needle really is. Once you push the globe back, you know, your needle is behind the equator of the globe. You can't hit the optic nerve. It's anatomically impossible to, to actually do that. His needle is not even all the way through. This is a five inch needle and half it's actually not in there. So it actually does not take much. And you'll see his needle right here. It's a short needle. You don't need to, those of you who are scared of doing retrobarbar, he only does peribarbar at all. And you'll see the same patient in the next slide, akinesia, didn't feel a thing, the entire surgery. So it's really possible to do that. Don't be scared of the block. I would not mess around trying a dystopical lidocaine gel or sedation. You can try that, but generally speaking, I, I've tried experimenting sometimes with that on some patients who I didn't want to do a block on because they had a, they were myopic or they had a scrotal buckle and then it just did not work too well. So I really do recommend just using a peribulbar block. Retrobulbar, if you want to, that's fine, but don't feel compelled too much to actually dig around there if you have to. Um, the parameters, the settings here, um, here's what we're doing. Here, this is a bit too anterior to watch what this doctor is actually doing. It's not me. Um, this is a bit too close to the cornea. I would push it back by just half a millimeter away. And that's how you can get safety. You're never going to have the trouble going just a half a millimeter to one millimeter posterior, especially for your myopic eyes, your high axial length eyes. Stay back there. Don't kind of creep into uh, the clear on clear where the clear foot plate hits the clear cornea. The settings are 2,000 milliwatts to 2,500, uh, five second, 50 seconds, five passes in a second. Duty cycle is standardized. The sweeping motion you'll see in this video, as well as, well as my video, coming up the next slide. Avoiding three, nine o'clock. A lot of it's anecdotal. Um, you can still do it, but part of it's voodoo, part of it's historical. You don't want to hit long ciliary nerves and have issues of midriasis, which I've never seen ever. And I've done many people 360. Um, also for pain, there's no need to do all that. We've had outstanding results avoiding those just two clock hours. Um, to don't hold it in place. It's kind of a sweeping motion out there. It's not just a focus. Those who do G probes, you kind of put two seconds and wait, two seconds and wait. This is just sort of a massaging uh, method around the eyes. Um, Dr. Desai, we did have a question um, about uh, anesthesia again. Uh, the question mm -hmm. was, uh, why not just um, light propofol 
um, and no block at all. Um, some folks are using just uh, mild propofol um, and not giving either a retrobol bar or a peribol bar block. And yeah, and what's exactly, your recommendation and, there? Exactly. So I tried that. I mean, so I, I heard in the AGS listserv that people are mentioning that, and so I tried that too. I mean, I don't, you know, I was like giving a block split myself, and so if I don't have to. I tried it with like 4% lidocaine uh, jelly with the light sedation. There's, it's 50-50. Some patients don't feel anything. Some patients really will say, mm, they're feeling pain. And um, I don't, then once you're feeling pain, you stop, you do a block. Once you're feeling pain once, no matter if you give retrobarbital block, one time I did it three times on a patient. And this poor guy, he felt everything. Even when I did the block retrobarbar myself, um, Three times I did a block, he put like 15 cc's of lidocaine back there. He still felt it. I mean, some people just have, once you have pain once, I don't know how anesthesiology works, pain control works, those nerve fibers are fired up. So you kind of miss the eight ball now. And he refused, it's been a year since, his pressure's great. I only did like I think, 20 seconds out of 100 on his eyes, but it got the job done. He was in the 30s, um, he was a blind eye, and now he's back in the teens. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, you can try it out there for yourself. The beauty about this procedure is you can try different things and you can't go wrong here, but don't expect too much. Don't uh, be prepared to do a block. The patient feels it. The worst thing you're going to do is you start doing it within seconds, they feel pain and now you're like, oh, great, I can't do it. So be prepared to do your peribulbar block if they feel pain. Um, but go ahead and try it. Some doctors do that just in my hands with my luck uh, it has not been the case for me. So now we have the patient. And the one good thing I like, it's also very, very efficient. So those of us in, in my IC, um, when we do it, I mean, you can be doing your dictation, your notes, whatever you need to do on the screen, answering your phone calls. And then once they're ready for you, the settings are already on the machine here and you just walk right in, no speculum, and you can just boom. So here you see me just walking. I just walked in 10 seconds ago, gloves on, and we just start. So here you see in real time, um, this treatment. So this is the viscous gel, gonia visc, and the foot plate here. He's a very, very uh, large lip fissure, so I'm just physically just doing the procedure myself. If those of you want to do it in the clinic, you do not have to have it done in the OR. We have a great OR, and the anesthesiologist just does the block, so if, and I'm in the OR like you know once or twice a week anyway, so it doesn't make a difference to me. You know, I'd rather just have them in the OR where it's all controlled. But if push comes to sub, then I can always do it um, in the clinic. If someone could not get to the OR because of COVID testing or medical clearance, then that's fine. So keep in watch um, the, the velocity of the movement. I'll zoom in on this in the next video, the next uh, slide over. This is a gentle moving session around it. Sorry, the exposure is bright. You'll see me change exposure in this video in just a second here. And you see my settings on the screen, 50 seconds uh, per hemisphere at 2,000 watts. That's your standard setting, doing five sweeps of the action. And now I just do the inferior here, in terms of time, I'll just show the whole thing. While we're watching me do this, are there any other questions about so far? Um, we did have one question. Uh, would like to know if we should be avoiding quadrants where um, a present express shunt, eye stent, or hydra is present. That's a good question. So there's, there's no data on that, but we can sort of make sense of how it looks like anecdotally. So express shunts, I would avoid. You never want to be messing with the blab or anything like that. So I'd avoid that small area of the express shunt. With the, um, one of the interesting factors of how Micropulse TLT works, actually, it's not purely just uh, modulating the ciliary body and its aqueous production. And also there's some evidence that actually it's pulling on the longitudinal fibers, fibers of the ciliary uh, processes, of ciliary body, actually opening up um, anteriorly, or actually inferiorly and, and deeper, the um, Schlem's canal and the scleral spur, kind of like pilocarpine does. So in that case, if you have a stent in your TM, in your canal, Surrounding areas should theoretically open up more. I can see you have a hydrus. And so you can do a hydrus for three o'clock hours. Hydrus looks great. You don't need to worry about damaging the hydrus or actually um, causing PS formation at all. If anything, because the hydrus has stents the canal very nicely, um, you can just treat over it. That's fine. Remember, you're aiming under the hydrus. That thing's in the canal. You're aiming the story body. There is very little sort of overlap in there. 
still, I would say just go for that um, if that's safe out there. Um, that using a tube analogy, um, tubes are larger. There are doctors who just kind of go all, all over the tubes. If it's covered by a scleral patch graft, they just do it right over it. Um, I myself just don't, just kind of like messing with tubes. I don't want exposure happening. But you can definitely do it over an stent. You can definitely do it over um, a hydrus. As far as I know, if I were you, what I plan on doing after I do several hydruses, I'll just, some patients, if it doesn't work later on, I'll just try half my patients avoiding the hydrus and half patients not avoiding hydrus and look at my own data six months, 12 months later, see how they all turned out on the gonioscopy with the UBM. So that's the joy of this thing. If you enjoy with inquisitive mind, try stuff out there, but there's no reason not to do that. And when I'm my next patients, I will not be avoiding the hydrus at all uh, for that. Otherwise, it's a good question. Even I stand, you don't have to avoid that at all, I don't think. It only augment the effect of those stents, not removing. So anyway, that was the whole procedure there. Let me zoom in for the next video here. Is it good to draw and mark the areas, how many millimeters behind the limbus? I would say no, because so um, the 810 nanometers actually um, is absorbed um, uh, by melanin. Let me just play this video so we can talk to Dr. Shmi while we're doing this thing here. If you use a marker, that marker, the ink, will actually absorb the energy. And now nothing gets deeper into the ciliary body. So avoid any kind of markers out there. You don't need a marker for this thing. That foot plate, you see the way it's designed, that yeah. foot plate sits on the, the scleral part of the cornea. Don't touch the clear, avoid clear like I'm doing here. Stay away from that clear area. And that's exactly okay. what you need to do. You don't have to mark anything. In fact, you can't because it'll, it'll ruin things. So here's a patient who was blind, patient in the 40s with pain, and I did 2,500, the highest dose, bypasses um, each 50 seconds in each hemisphere. She did great. Her pressure, we saw her post up day one. Uh, pressure was uh, uh, under 20 on uh, no drops. She forgot to use her drops. Um, post op regimen, I've, back in the day, we tried doing it with like atropine, BID, and steroids for a whole month, and you know, Durazole. And now it's, like it's, it, it, it's even just generic Pred Forte QID for one week, no ticket burn. I mean, it's the same regimen I use for an LPI. It's that comfortable. You don't need to use subconj decks. I mean, you can do these things if you want to, you don't have to. If DEXAQ is covered, I put DEXAQ in the lid when I do these things, and that's enough. And then no drops. If they want drops, they can. Otherwise, that, uh, not DEXAQ, I apologize, um, uh, uh, DEXTENSA, DEXTENSA in the uh, lacrimal um, um, canaliculus is enough for the eyes. This is extremely uh, painless procedure, even post-op. I don't see any iritis or CME at all, and all, not just me, all the studies you see don't really show that for this thing at all. So um, yeah, again, point at your main point, Dr. Shmim, no need to mark. Um, the eye, but you can't definitely use a marker. You will absorb the marker will absorb the energy, not the um, ciliary body. Okay. What I want to sort of do now, as we kind of wrap things up here, is just kind of show you like um, my experience and my micro data points here. So here's me doing this now on some uh, standalone. So on average, you see many many patients here, and I'm using just the P3 probe, the one from November. So not the many many dozens and dozens and scores of other patients just the one that from this better safety probe that they had coming out. And look at least my almost you know, two to three month data. I could have longer data, but then we had the pandemic. So these patients could not come in, like the January patients could not come in for the three month visit. And now they're slowly coming back in July. So that's why I don't have enough data, even though it was doing well. And overall you see pressure we're getting to 22, went down to 15 on the same number of drops. So a good reduction on something that took literally hundred seconds to do. Power modulation settings are how I tweaked it. So I enjoy doing this kind of with Brian together. We kind of like sit there and before I walk into a room, we kind of study the patient's chart, seeing their risk factors, what their Tmax is, what the target should be, what their, how much, how sick the eye is, what I'm looking for. And we kind of decide together what pressure, what power modulations will do. You can't go wrong 2000 milliwatts doing 100 seconds, but you've seen it many times tweaking it to 2250. I do a lot of 2250s now in 100 uh, seconds for five sweeps uh, per hemisphere. Some patients, I'll, if I want a target of a nine, I'll do a 2,500. So again, this is something you can decide on your own for you starting off for everyone, start off like what I did on 2,000. And when I like to do things in general, whether it's doing FACO or whatever, every 100 case of FACO, I intentionally will do something different. I'll intentionally use a different FACO chopper. I'll intentionally do doing different technique, whatever it takes. Uh, I just force myself to do something better and better and better every 100 cases to become, to learn something new. And similarly for this thing here, start off with your 2,000 milliwatts, 
150 seconds per hemisphere, five sweeps, um, two hemispheres. And then look at your results three months later and then tweak it and see how it works for you for your kinds of patients out there. Um, these profiles work good for me. Um, apart from this one outlier, um, which she got she did worse. So she's the next slide. Everyone else did pretty darn good on this technology actually here. Um, these are people who are 2025. 20, so a lot of them had cataract surgery before. Um, and you'll see how the settings work with on the slide. So a lot of them actually went down and dropped by a couple of points here, 16 and a half to 14. So at least like, you know, three millions of mercury less on the same number of drops, which is at least better than before for something that's actually was very safe to do for a very, very healthy seeing eye. You know, some eyes, it's had to say, are just cursed bad protoplasm. I mean, this poor lady had canal plasty, an eye stent, an amid valve, and a previous CBC continuous wave years ago comes to me and Poor thing is still at 26. Even though I use a higher setting, she's still about the same thing here. You know, I'm hoping her pressure does come down later on, but um, some eyes are like that. And that's just the life of uh, being a glaucoma specialist is you're gonna see people like this. You don't give up, you do what it takes. I'd love to do another Ahmed valve and fear nasally or Ahmed clear path on her, but she just refused incisional surgery because you can't blame her, she's been through so much already. Um, but um, you see how I like to do it with the um, POAG, it actually helps it as well. Um, you can do it, those of you who do it with uh, ECP, try doing it with Baker. It's actually quicker, more efficient in the OR, no big contraption, wheeling it in. You just kind of go there, do it, boom, scrub, wash your hands, do whatever you need to do, pick the lenses, that kind of stuff, while they're getting the patient prepped. And you see pressure drops from like you know, 16 down to like 12. So a nice, nice drop um, on patients who are just getting FACO done. Um, so I like it a lot. I mean, this is more powerful than ECP. Actually, in my opinion, it's safer because you're not keep the um, eye open while you're doing something, less risk of any foreign body or bacteria from the nasty lids getting inside the eyes. So just it's less is more here. One of my go-to punches I've done before is actually uh, doing it with Zen. So you can do it with MIG surgery to make MIGs more effective. Uh, March 11th was my last day. When I was there, they told me it's my last day in the OR and they're gonna close the OR down. They're gonna be Governor put restrictions on there. Our office was unclear what our office was doing because of all restrictions. So I wasn't sure whether I could even see him post up day one. I couldn't, Zen's required, you know, I'm pretty aggressive with needlings. I keep on needling someone until they say uncle. Um, my goal is to get my pressure up you know, under 12 when I, when, I, when I do with Zen. That involves 5FU, that involves a lot of needlings. If I can't do needling, the office is closed. So now I'm like, shoot, what do I do now? So these are two patients I did that day, 57 year old African American man, traumatic glaucoma, full field, mild stage, pressure was 36 though. I did a Zen um, last year, I think ab internal back then, and I switched, I converted to ab external over the summer. Um, his IP were in the teens for months, great, but somehow by January, February, he was 29. So then I did Zen ab external, same 40 micrograms, micrograms of my vitamin C, 2,500 inferior in the field, 50 seconds, five passes. And now three months later, I just saw him actually just last week, uh, IIP is seven under drops. So for me, that technique, I kind of hit it hard, 2250, 2500 in the inferior hemifield. Again, voodoo, I don't like touching virgin cons. If I'm gonna do a Zen, I want it to be clean. I don't want one eye to be red. I don't want anything to be there. I want it to be, like the way I did my, my traps, I want it to be perfect virgin tissue. I don't want anything messing it up. It's, it's voodoo, you can totally do it over. I'm just super suspicious, uh, superstitious when it comes to conj. 84 year old white man, his tricycle, uh, left eye. He had everything done to it. We don't know the story. Right eye is always only eye seeing left. 10 2 island in this only seeing eye, rapidly progressing. Target is, in my opinion, 12. Person been 20. He's been delaying it forever. It delays any kind of surgery because you can't blame him. His left eye went on tricycle. So I said, convince him to do a Zen, ab external, with a CPC. And I did 2250, not just 2000, because I don't, I want this thing to work. I can't. If I can't needle the Zen, I want this thing to actually work. So I created it to 2250, not 2500, because maybe his tysis in the other eye, his eye is sick. So I just backed off a little bit, only half the eye, not 360, just in here, if him, if him, if him, if him, if field, five passes. Look at the results one week, one month, three months later, on no drops. This, I'm very, very comfortable with, with this man. I'm happy his eye is going to be saved. So this combo has worked great for me, um, but try combinations yourself and how it works for your MIGs. I'll close with just last two slides. Dr. Desai, we, yeah, sure. Oh, sorry, we, we got uh, two questions real quick here that I just don't want to miss. Um, one of them was, 
can you talk a little bit more about how you combine it with FACO? Do you block these patients? Uh, do you treat before you do FACO? Um, do you treat 360 degrees? And does it affect um, your surgery or your incision? That's one question. Yeah, great question. So I can all go to the, the FACO ones. So they're already blocked by the anesthesiologist already. So they're already blocked. So and then for these patients, I do 360 degrees um, of the treatment. It does not affect where I do the incisions. I'm not worried about any kind of wound contracture because I treated a corneal. It makes no difference. This is going to be yeah, no difference whatsoever. There's no wound leak. That's there's that's all done by older technology, which had liquid interface. It makes no difference. Nothing. Um, if you're superstitious, and it's okay to be superstitious in glaucoma, we are like that. We do a lot of things that don't make any sense. But hey, voodoo works. Voodoo works. I'm all about voodoo. If results are results. I'm for it. If it makes you happy, all right. Well, you're avoiding three and nine o'clock anyway, so you can avoid that temporal, um, you know, two o'clock hours before you make your main decision. You can do it over the paracentesis. Again, there's no evidence to be that leery about it. Again, it's voodoo that makes you happy. That's still fine because you shouldn't be touching that temporal area anyway because of the ciliary of um, um, the nerves. And I do 360 degrees, depending on what I want. I kind of go for like 2000 milliwatts to 2250 milliwatts for uh, 360 degrees, at least on two hemispheres. That's how I do it with the FACO. Now, the other question we had was um, in regards to the liquid, the viscous uh, liquid interface, are you applying once or do you apply um, between every quadrant? Yeah, good question. So I, I, I don't, um, I'm not cheap when it comes to this thing, to the sad thing. So I'll do it on one part of the eyes. And then before I do her other half of the eyes, we'll put even more. Um, back when I was doing quadrants, so that I, did, I put even more on the eyes. So I'm all about putting as much as it takes. It doesn't take too much. Go for it. I mean, I, 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 I don't care. I mean, I just, I, I, I go for what I need to do. Each hemisphere requires new visco um, out there. And you can tell how it actually works. So this is a small thing just for you to see how old it works. So this little light beam, part of it, if you don't have enough visco, it becomes a fuzzy image. If you have enough, it looks like a sharp point. So this is part of it, just part of it's the reflections artifact of testing. You can't tell what we're looking at here. That's not, that's because looking through the probe, but you'll see me as I go in the other direction here, I put more viscoelastic, even when I'm doing a sweep, you can do it during a sweep, stop and add more. Don't be stingy. Those, you know, so you'll see how precise that light is. See, you know exactly what you're treating. You're not treating any corneal limbal stellum cells whatsoever. That involves the, um, the visco. So put it as much as you want to the eye. Typically just a little goo is enough for the superior and inferior. And that should just be adequate enough for you. Um, last two ones I'll Great. talk about. Thank those you. Of, yeah, anyone who actually in the audience who does glaucoma surgery. Here's someone, I get a lot of referrals from Wills because people from Central Jersey don't want to go back there. This was an Indian lady. She had IFPs in the 40s, had an Ahmed valve years ago, and it was exposed. Uh, Wills told her to get it explanted. Um, she refused, came to me for second opinion, exposed Ahmed valve, um, supraternal quadrant. I told her ideally I would take that out and just put an infranasal tube shunt, but she refused that because Dr. Google told her that it should be repositioned. So I said, fine, okay, if I can do it safely, I'll do it. I, in the OR, I explanted the tube. The overlying sclera was just too ratty and thin for me to comfortably covered again. You know what I'm saying? Like there's not, it's all scar tissue, it was all some melted patch. It was just, I tried doing it, but this was not going through. I didn't feel comfortable about it being eroded through it again. So I opted not to do that. Uh, but instead, instead of going through an inferior nasal tube shunt, which we could have done before this, I did some micropulse um, to the inferior hemifield, um, high, the, higher, the higher dose, that was enough. Someone whose pressure was 15 on three meds, now 14 on one med. Not 15 is because there's probably some leak around the tube, maybe. Um, but so she's doing great. And I've started just, that surgery was, yeah, six months ago. So she's doing great right now. So it does kind of help you avoid the scary parts of doing glaucoma surgery. This is another patient, my last slide here, um, with a blood revision. So this poor guy had cataract surgery with an ACIOL back in the 1990s. Uh, ACIO led to PBK. He had three corneal transplants. That's not his picture, by the way. That's, that's clearly just an example of a very overhanging, overfiltering bleb. He had three PKP stitches all over the place. At Wills, um, they, he tried to get in contact lens fitting over his eyes, but he couldn't because the whole bleb couldn't fit over it. So I, back in the last year, I did a um, bleb revision just to, couldn't do a palm book suture. I took all the conch down. I just kind of closed it stitching naturally with Vicryl. Still, the contact lens wouldn't fit. 
two months later, I did a blood revision. I just opened up the blood superiorly and found this huge one by one millimeter black gape in the middle of the sclera, just spewing um, aqueous humor. So that's why he was overfiltrating. So, and, and that's how surgery was done back in the 19, you know, 90s. We did mitomycin sponges right there. That thing was never going to heal. Um, so then I just did a, um, sorry, it's very geeky, plugged it up with the amniotic membrane and the scleral patch, sutured the heck out of that thing, and he did well for a while. His blood was covered, blood was gone at that point, um, and he just, um, he was able to wear a contact lens. Pressure is hard to say because he had three corneal transplants. It's really hard to know what his real pressure is. It's 39. Um, I did not want to do a tube in this case. I felt his infranasal tube either. Um, I felt it was just way too scarred. Superiorly, I knew the whole tissue was ratty because I was there. Infranasal, I knew I took it down and scarred it up there. I Even I did a pars plana tube, I wanted to avoid further hardware, even if it's pars plana under the iris, and do a fourth PKP. So this is someone I'm really worried about just really decomposing the cornea. Um, I mean, how many PKPs can the guy have? So I did micropulse TLT, inferior hemifield only, 2,500. Two months later, pressure's 20. With the unclear pressure because it's actually, you know, a, a PKPI. So overall, we're more comfortable with it. So this could have been a very, very complicated, risky, unclear, surprising glaucoma surgery. It really helped punt the ball and win the game versus trying to go for like, you know, fourth and like goal and really trying to get a touchdown out of this thing. You just have to win the game for the patient. You don't have to always be a hoops hero, especially if you know you're running into trouble. So here, any glaucoma surgery, anyone's hands would have had trouble with this one. Here, we took care of the patient better, and he's doing well. So again, in the conclusion here, avoid this. Try your best. I know days are hard. Life is hard. Hope your practice get very busy, and you're swamped with patients, and there's too many coming through. You just want to survive. I get it. If there's moments of time in your day um, when you actually can stop this, say, you know what, pressure's not above un under 15. Let's stop kicking the can, spinning the wheel. Let's do something here. If you're not comfortable with any of these MIGs, I love doing all the MIGs. I love operating. I love doing omnic valves, omni zens, hydras, KDB. I, I love everything. But if sometimes if the patient doesn't want it, and you want something that's, and you don't want to you know, learn these techniques, try, try Micropulse TLT. Try it out there. See how it works in your hands. Can't hurt. It's not going to be CPC at all. And see how it does for you. I hope it actually plays a good part of your uh, toolkit to help the patients out. Any questions about things here, you can always email me directly. That's Brian's contact information um, as well. Any questions, please ask. Otherwise, I know it's getting late, guys. Um, thank you so much. Any questions thank at all? You. Yeah. Uh, we do have a couple still, I'm sorry. Um, so uh, patient um, SPRD repair times two with silicone oil, uh, not in the anterior chamber, IOP of 50, uh, with no history of glaucoma. Um, the treating physician is not sure if the retina specialist is going to be removing the oil or not. Um, would just like to hear a, a recommendation. Yeah, I had a patient. Treating with Micropulse on Friday, actually. Nice. So I, I just had a patient like that. Um, young guy, bounced around over New Jersey. Same thing happened. Like, and when I look into his eyes, I do gonioscopy, I see these bubbles of silicon oil in his eyes. I'm thinking, did anyone mean do silicon? And he had history of retinal attachment. So I asked him, did word silicon ever come up in the picture? He goes, oh, yeah. The first doctor did this, and then yada, yada, some weird story. I'm like, I don't think the silicon is gone. And so I said, it's been a year since you've written a surgery. I'm not sure if you get PVR or what the story is, but like, um, I'd recommend getting the silicon out of the eyes because you can't put a tube in these eyes. It's not going to work anymore. It will be clogged up with, with silicon. I mean, even do it inferiorly. Um, and so I just, I'm lucky I have great retina surgeons I work with. So I just called one of them up. I told him the story. Hey, I got this story here. What do you think? He goes, you know what? Send them over and we'll, we'll take it out there. We'll get the records from the other doctors. I, I had to call the retina doctor myself. So what's his name? And lucky I know a lot of retina doctors and say, do you plan on taking the silicon out of the eye? Oh yeah, he's supposed to come in for three month visit. He does a no show. And what happened to that guy? I'm like, oh, the patient was saying, oh yeah, I don't want to go back to him because I still can't see. And the story emerges. So you've got to get the story straight. Is silicon coming out or not? Um, sooner than later. Can't, maybe they're getting out and needs a definite answer. Either it's happening or not happening. Um, assuming you have time, pressure is under say 35 or even under under 40, just wait. If the nerve can handle it, it's a 0.2 or 0.3 like my patient, just wait. If the nerve is really sick, 0.9 or 0.8 or something, then I think a light CPC would be worth it right now. Realize that the pressure will drop dramatically when silicon's out of the eyes, dramatically, like 20 points. For my patient, I didn't touch the eye surgically. I just fiddled with some eye drops here 
And then um, his pressure went from 43 down to under 20, just getting silicon out of the eyes. That's it. So the re hero was the retina surgeon. It was not me whatsoever. For you, the pressure was getting 40s. You know, on Diamox, maybe just a 2,000 milliwatt. That, that, and with the 100 um, uh, seconds, five sweeps each hemisphere, you know, the standard setting, that's great. You're not going to get into a tysis. Even the silicon's out, you're not going to get hypotenuse with that at all. So I would recommend those regimens um, for, for you initially, if you're above the 40. If you're under 40, then I would just hold off on it until you get your story straight. But just call your favorite under person um, to get the story, yeah, about that. You need a definite answer on that one. Okay, great. Uh, another one is on um, retreatment. Um, you know, uh, you know, do you recommend retreatment with Micropulse TLT? Um, if so, um, how often? Um, fortunately for me, I've not had to retreat anyone just yet. Um, I do to retreat people back with the G probe days. Um, with retreatment, I would start off, see what you did before. So um, if you're doing 22, like 2000, I would crank it up by another 250 milliwatts. So if you're using 2000 milliwatts, um, then crank it up to, to 2250. Um, and then I would not go from 2000 to 2500 that quickly out there um, in that regard. I would make sure your technique is better. Maybe have the rep or Brian come with you to watch you're doing it to make sure you have enough liquid interface coupling. Your position probe is just perfect. Those little nuances but you can always increase it more. And just tell the patient like, hey, this is the price we pay for a bladeless procedure. You know, this is just what it is. They said, we can do more definitive. If you're tired of the pressure being the 20s, I get it, it's frustrating. I want your pressure to be a 13.2, but I can't do it without a blade. So boring a blade, I'd rather do it safety. And I use the analogy of a stairwell. We can jump 10 flights of stairs, or we just take one step at a time or two steps at a time. It's a lot safer this way, but it becomes frustrating. I don't want to put you in danger by jumping too quickly. As long as you explain why you're doing this thing conservatively, no one's ever going to give you a hard problem uh, about this at all. But yeah, I would just increase by 250 um, the next stage, retreat it again. Great. That's all the questions that I have here. Does anybody else have any questions? Please feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Shimjim. If any questions do pop up here, these are our email addresses. You can always email and Happy to talk to you guys offline about this thing. It really is a joy playing with the settings. Like so every 10 cases, wait three months and see what works in your hands. I mean, for me, like, like my go-to punch now for this is like this superior Zen and inferior 2500 to 2250 inferior hemifield. You know, not 2000 for both hemispheres, just that's much a little higher energy for inferior. And that's given me like these single digit numbers uh, under 12 pretty consistently uh, for at least three months. At least that voodoo, that, that system works for me in my hands. So the joy is this work with you and see what plays with your hands. Your numbers and your settings will be different from mine, but there's a method to the madness. There's a science behind all this thing. That's what actually becomes fun. I'd rather do this all day than like fiddle with drops all day and going nowhere versus getting some nice numbers that are under 12. It's just much more, much more fun and fulfilling for me. Oh, we just had a, a last minute question come in. Do you change the settings for more pigmented patients? Yeah, so you now I thought about doing that. The whole thought is like pigmented patients, you know, the iris is pigmented, so then the sort of body is more pigmented, they can absorb more energy. And blue irises don't need as much. And this is being a bit of a nerd. I love doing clinical trials. Um, the more variables you add, it's harder to become systematic about it. So for me, you see the way I'm doing my numbers here is that um, if I start I rather know my settings constantly and not worry about um, what eye color, iris color someone has. So when I look at my settings here, there's no column here in this setting about iris color. That is another variable. I rather keep the variables to like the power and how many hemispheres. That's it. I don't want to add like, oh, what's this thing for blue irises, this one for, it just gets too complicated as we're learning technology as I get, and I'm learning too along with you guys, as I learn what settings work best for me as I get my 12, my own personal, you know, probe came out in November. As I look and I'll do an audit with Brian on my own, on my 12 month data on my cases, then I'll, I may tweak things differently for blue eyes and for brown eyes. But right now, while you're learning, keep it the same. You don't need to fiddle with things at all. I don't think it makes much of a difference. The studies that are published on this never separates people from blue eyes to brown eyes. These are all published studies. They just give you results. So because published studies don't do that, 
I and maybe you don't want to do that as you're learning. Otherwise, it gets too kooky, too many variables when you're doing this setting. Keep it simple. Yeah, great. And, and to piggyback on, on that comment, um, you know, Iridex is definitely happy to help uh, sit down and work with you on optimizing your settings. Uh, we have a fantastic uh, clinical application team that will work with you in addition to myself, um, the regional managers, and uh, even uh, Kevin Lamarsh is our director of uh, clinical education is on this call here. We're, we're happy to discuss your outcomes with you to help you optimize your settings safely so that you get the best outcomes while you know, not endangering your patients. So please feel free to reach out to us if you have any, uh, any questions in terms of optimizing your settings. Perfect. Thanks. Great. Well, thank you everybody for attending. Uh, a special thank you to Dr. Desai for putting on this presentation. This was excellent. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for the great questions that we had here as well too, uh, very informative. Um, and again, please, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to Dr. Desai or myself. Um, if you didn't catch his email, um, I can forward that to you. If you have further questions that you'd like to ask uh, of him, um, you know, just feel free to reach out as necessary. Thank you again. Thank you all.